Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. This is a pictorial report encompassing three diversified activities. Two of them have settings which are familiar to us all. The Reserve Officers Training Program in America's colleges and the story of the thousands of civilians who play a vital role in our defense effort. The third story comes from a place which was once considered a remote, romantic island in the Pacific. An island which now contains the hard core of hope for 400 million people, Formosa. But first, let's take a look at the army behind the army. Sometimes called the fourth man, civilians from every walk of life are contributing a tremendous variety of skills and knowledge to keep our fighting team the world's best. This is an actual scene of war soldiers advancing to engage the enemy. These are the men in uniform at one end of the long line of our country's defense effort. A line that touches a battlefield at one end and reaches deep into America, into the ranks of its citizens without uniforms at the other. No, that's not a man from Mars. He's part of the great civilian force serving the army in a very special way. His efforts, which seem to go nowhere on that treadmill, are recorded and analyzed by a physiologist and enable our army to better gauge its strength. And here is another who is serving in a special way. He's not simply flying that balloon for pleasure. He's helping to develop and test intricate radar weather equipment which will be of great value to our services. These technicians are part of a vast civilian army who are augmenting our soldiers in the field. There are four basic ways in which they support our military mission. Some have special abilities, which would not be otherwise available. Like this glass blower, who works at a trade that takes years of apprenticeship in order to shape complicated glass instruments. Scientists who help to design and supervise the manufacture of new and complicated equipment, which is tailored to suit the needs of the soldier. Coffee sampling is a rather esoteric occupation which requires unusually sensitive taste buds. The findings of these samplers, along with those of expert dietitians who are constantly experimenting with new methods of food preparation and packaging, are responsible for the development of improved rations for our soldiers in garrison or in the field. The results of a decade of experimentation are clearly shown by the changes which have taken place in the contents of the assault pack. A very necessary part of the civilian force is concerned with personnel administration. Other civilians take care of records, such as army payrolls, dependency benefits, and the greater proportion of vital records of the army. Another important segment of our civilians in the employ of the Army are concerned with the manufacture of weapons and supplies. These members of our unseen Army are freeing military personnel for primarily military duties. Many skills and occupations are involved in the manufacture of clothing and equipment. This fabric tester, for example, 
he handles one of the first steps in the production of uniforms and other soft goods. Cloth cutters have an important job. A mistake here is costly, and the confidence and years of experience needed for this trade is not likely to be found among members of the armed forces. Machine operators perform many types of work necessary to completely equip a fighting man. These government workers are paid at piecework rates. Their productivity is at the same high level as maintained in other industries. A big advantage in having certain types of civilians work in the production of military goods and services is that, in many cases, they would not be subject to active military duty, and our defense program can be assured of continuity of effort. The civilian's normal work is not interrupted by military activities that often reduce the availability of army personnel. This utilization of civilian manpower has increased the depth of our army by almost 30 percent. Just like the soldier, civilian employees are concerned with saving money. In the various kinds of production, there is a constant watch for ways and means of saving money. Maintenance on army installations is performed by the fourth man of the team. Civilians can continue longer in a single assignment or location than can be expected of military personnel. The stability provided by these workers who may serve many years in one particular trade makes rotation of soldiers possible within the military system. Men like the plumber who keeps the utilities in working order. Or the electrician who sees that the power supply is always operating. and the guards who maintain the security of army installations. Civilian buyers are down at the wholesale market dealing with the suppliers of top quality foods. These civilians are experts in bargaining for the lowest price on the current market. The army is the largest single buyer of food and equipment in the world. In addition to those who do the actual purchasing, there are a great many analysts and experts who assist them in making the best buy. There is an enormous range of jobs performed by the Army's civilians. Some of them are seagoing, like these men who operate a special vessel of the Corps of Engineers, which keeps the rivers and harbors free of driftwood and other obstacles. Some army civilians take the place of the soldier in the training of other soldiers. They form a hard core of instructors for the expansion of our army in the event of all-out mobilization. The place of civilians on the nation's defense team gives our army four big advantages. It gives abilities not otherwise available, assures a stable administration and operation, provides a corps of trained personnel for any emergency, and frees the soldier for duty in the line. These are the civilians of the army establishment. They work in army installations in your community. They are the non-uniformed teammates of the soldier in the line. Working together at their trades and crafts, their professions and specialties, they are an integral part of the ground defense force, the fourth man on the army team.
Well, that's the story of Army civilians who play such an important role in our national defense. We swing now to the Far East, where our Army is making a special contribution to the pool of strength of the free world. Taiwan is its name in Chinese. Formosa is what it's called in English. Only 90 miles from the mainland, it's the home and hope of free China. This was a story that made recent headlines. These men had been soldiers of the Chinese Communist Army fighting in Korea. More than 14,000 prisoners of war who refused to return to the totalitarian way of life in the Korean prisoner exchange. This was the greeting they received as they joined the forces of free China on the tiny island of Formosa. A wildly enthusiastic crowd jammed the docks as they came down the gangplank. A solidly packed, cheering mass shouted its welcome as the trucks bearing these new additions to the cause of freedom rolled through the streets of Taipei, the capital city. After many years, they were in a place where individual freedom still exists. They were in a new resurgent land, a land of marked contrasts, where primitive is side by side with the modern, where the techniques of the past are yet in evidence but are being shed as rapidly as modern methods can be introduced. Vast expansions in the electric power is increasing production of goods, which once had to be transported thousands of miles, products which might someday be necessary in the liberation of their homeland. Many contrasts are marked by the main government building, a relic of the days of Japanese rule. The statue of Sun Yat-sen, founder of the Chinese Republic. Ox carts and automobiles share the streets which contain Western-style department stores. And the products of the Hollywood studios. A conspicuous feature on Formosa is the intensity of the campaigning for public office. Here is something which has not existed on the Chinese mainland since the day the communists gained control. Free elections take place here without fear of reprisals. These people are voting for the election of local mayors and magistrates, but they are also casting their ballot for their country's position in a tense world, a world divided by an iron curtain. By their alignment with the forces of freedom, they have indicated their unwillingness to be a part of a Soviet-controlled empire. Aid from America is assisting the free Chinese in their efforts to become a free, modern, democratic nation. Recently, the nationalist forces received their first shipment of jet airplanes. Generalissimo and Madame Chiang Kai-shek watch a demonstration of the fighters' capabilities on their delivery to a Formosan airfield. The major effort of nationalist China is the rebuilding of a robust and potent army. One of the most valuable parts of American aid is the Military Assistance Advisory Group, or as it's commonly called, MAG. Officers and men of the United States Army are imparting their skills, knowledge, and experience to the effort on Formosa. They are giving advice to an intense training program which encompasses every phase of military operation. The ways of modern warfare are complex, and while some of these Chinese are veterans of many years of fighting on the mainland, most of them have to undergo constant reorientation and practice in the utilization of current weapons of war. 
As it would be an impossible job for the few MAG personnel to train an entire army, much of the effort is concentrated in the officer's training school. These trainees will then pass on the knowledge to the bulk of the Nationalist Army. Demonstrations are given of all the basic weapons. This class is learning the nomenclature of a mortar sight. But technical information by itself serves little purpose to a soldier, and there are constant sessions of practical application of what's been learned in the classes. Nationalist officer candidates learn to operate all the weapons of the infantrymen. Conditioning both men and machines is a vital part of the program, to which the MAG instructors have given much advice. Equipment gets a periodic inspection, and all of it is kept in top working condition, ready to be used in an instant. The soldiers on Formosa spend a great deal of their time working in the field. These sessions on the other side of the globe are helping to strengthen the defense of the free world in the Far East. During the frequent maneuvers, combat conditions are closely reproduced to give an accurate flavor of what could be expected in a real war. Most of the new arrivals from the Korean compounds have already become members of the nationalist forces. They have seen communism in action and will not soon forget it. Today, they are training with the forces of freedom while they dream of a free China for the 400 million on the other side of the South China Sea. The flags of America and free China fly side by side as the fighting force of the nationalists shows its combined strength in a giant parade at Taipei. Major General William C. Chase, commander of our MAG unit, reviews the results of U.S. assistance. No longer a bedraggled group of refugees, the armed forces of free China have now become an important contribution to the total strength of the free world. Men and equipment stream past the reviewing stand, an impressive fighting force ready to guard against the aggression of communism, made more effective through the assistance of the United States Army. Yes, our military mission to free China's fighting men may be the guiding hand of their destiny. Now for a subject close to home. Our cameras focus on the college campuses, where the youth of today are learning to be the leaders of tomorrow as members of the Reserve Officers Training Corps. Each year, our colleges and universities turn out a new group of young men who have received specialized training for their future roles in life. Each college has some special features of which it is proud. 
One of the most distinguished courses common to the curriculum of most institutions of higher learning is that course called General Military Science, or as it's more commonly known, the Reserve Officers Training Corps. You're probably aware that during the history of our country, almost every generation has been called upon to enter military service. That is one of the major reasons your government established ROTC as part of your college career. You're probably wondering what ROTC can do for you. Well, it can do a lot. Primarily, it will give you first-hand knowledge of military science and tactics and train you to become officers and leaders in the defense and development of our country. It will teach you the principles of leadership which are essential for a civilian as well as military success. It will teach you how to get along with and lead your fellows. It's a four-year course. Freshmen and sophomores study a wide range of subjects from military symbols and elementary map reading to an understanding of the powder kegs and danger spots throughout the world. Other subjects include learning the way to select the right man for a job. Training in the M1 rifle is a must for every cadet. Its nomenclature and maintenance become thoroughly familiar. Most colleges have indoor rifle ranges. They're scaled down to use 22 caliber ammunition in the M1 rifle. They develop the eye at a fraction of the cost of regular ammunition. Not a bad score. He squeezed rather than pulled the trigger. An opportunity for developing the qualities of leadership are given to top cadets in their second year. They get a chance to practice on new cadets and build their self-confidence in handling men. There are many branches of the Army in which a cadet can take specialty training. They can pick a service which closely fits into their college course and have the advantage of supplementary training in a field in which they eventually plan to earn a living. The quartermaster course is profitable to those cadets who are interested in merchandising as a career or in any field where distribution is important. Engineers work with problems common to civil and military activities. Automotive engineering is an important part of the Ordnance Corps. Stripped down vehicles give a part by part understanding. ROTC veterinary units have been established at many colleges. The care of military animals, mules, horses, and dogs is the job of the Veterinary Corps. But a fighting army needs fighting weapons, and an understanding of big guns is the major concern of those students who are interested in the artillery. Infantry students get to set up and handle all the weapons of the infantrymen in addition to their small arms. After two years of training, a student executes a written agreement to complete phase three and four of the military science course. The advanced course discusses subjects on the strategic as well as the tactical level. Third year means summer camp for members of the ROTC. Most branches have their own camps and students converge on them from every part of the country for six weeks of active duty. The cadet is now a soldier and subject to army regulations. He gets a physical examination army style and when he limbers up, it's by the numbers. During his stay in camp, there is much variation in duties and position. One day, a student may be a wire stringer. On another, he may be a company commander. 
or become involved in an all-day maintenance job. He's housed under canvas and learns to live and get along with others. And when he eats, it's out in the open where the food has a special tang that's hard to beat. Units of the regular army frequently put on special demonstrations for the benefit of members of ROTC. Here, a lineman has suffered an injury while working high on a pole. The cadets see the special technique for getting him safely down. There are also demonstrations of the latest kinds of equipment, the kind that would not ordinarily be seen on a college campus. This television camera is part of a mobile unit, which is becoming an important part of military communications. Through its electronic eye, pictures of tactical situations in the line can be instantly viewed at headquarters. But participation is most important. On combat maneuvers, they learn the many things that enable an army to fight and sustain itself in battle. These men are becoming better prepared to better serve. Their service in ROTC has broadened their experience. Graduates are candidates for appointment as second lieutenants in the Army Reserve or National Guard. Some outstanding students may be selected for regular Army commissions. Now, the biggest source of junior officers in our Army, it has become the symbol of leadership, ROTC. Learn today lead tomorrow. America's young men are better prepared to better serve. And that winds up this pictorial report. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another look at your army in action on the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.